Okay, it's not over yet. So the main event of the evening is a panel discussion on climate change and species extinction. What role can tourism play in conservation? So I don't know if anyone's actually seen the report by the UN basically saying that tourism is quite damaging to the environment, to animals, to all of those things. And what can we do as an industry to help with that? So we've got, um, I won't introduce everybody because um, our moderator will do that. So I'll introduce her. Um, Professor Rachel Dwyer is Professor of Indian Cultures and Cinema at SOAS, University of London. Um, her most recent book is Bollywood's India, Hindi Cinema as a Guide to Modern India. And she's currently working on Bombay before Mumbai. Um, her other research interests include the Asian elephant in India, so it's important that she's here representing the interests of some of our partners. Um, and I'll hand over to her to introduce the rest of the panel and start the discussion. today, Sanjay Alex and Shafi, who first suggested my name for this. Um, it's been a, it's a fascinating experience. It's something completely new to me to come to this sort of event, and it's a lovely evening. People have brought the lovely weather from India with them today. Not quite as warm, but wait till Saturday. And um, we've, we're going to talk about something which is seen as a really negative viewpoint, and we're not here to just launder it and whitewash it, but we're here to actually look at the serious issues behind um, this United Nations report that have been raised, problems to do with tourism, but we, we want to be more positive tonight. We want to ask what can tourism actually do and how can we do it from here as well. So many, many aspects to be, rain, to be raised. So we have a wonderful panel with us tonight. Each of them is going to say a little bit about his work before we begin. So to my left, I've got Duncan McNair, um, who's a lawyer. Um, and although, although that's his major work, and that's a great person to have in animal um, welfare causes, um, he is here tonight as part of his work on the Asian elephant and he has a petition which I know he wants you all to sign. He's taken part in key groups representing charities and MPs and is trying to use some leverage um, with the government here, whoever we have as Prime Minister in the days to come. And then we have Raghu Chandawat, um, whose book you might have seen recently, The Emerald Tigers, just got mentioned in the Times Literary Supplement as one of the most important books on tigers to appear for many years. Um, he originally worked with snow leopards in Ladakh, but now is very famous for his work with the tigers, the emerald tigers of Banna in Madhya Pradesh in India, the emerald tigers, and he has received many awards, and he's also made a documentary on the topic. And lastly, Ian Redmond, OB, there's so many titles, I'm not quite sure what they all mean. Um, but Ian is a tropical field biologist and conservationist, but best known perhaps for his film work. I saw with great envy his work on mountain gorillas involved the famous episode with Sir David Attenborough, who's, of course, um, one of our great heroes. And in, many, in four decades of work, he too, like Duncan, has been active um, in the ban on the ivory trade. Um, and he is best known for his 100 documentaries and films. So what I've asked people to do, rather than me telling you what they do, is to speak for themselves just for a few minutes and why they're here tonight. Perhaps what interested them and what they hope to achieve. Duncan, may I begin with you? Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a real privilege uh, to address you, and thank you to Sanjay and his highly efficient team uh, for for setting up this, uh, or this, uh, this great evening. Um, I'm a lawyer, as has been said, by a profession, but uh, I, I do do other things. Um, I founded Save the Asian Elephants, or STAY, as we call it, after my first trip to India some five and a half years ago. I'd heard of the wonders of India and its kaleidoscopic history and culture, uh, but I'd also heard of some less uh, palatable things about the plight of the elephants. Um, I want to set in very, very clear context that our own country here has nothing to be proud of as far as its treatment of animals, the overwhelming majority of whom are, in, are tied up in factory farming. 
Uh, and indeed, that Britain has played its less than noble part in the past uh, in the hunting of elephants and of many other endangered species. Um, anyway, I went to India and I sought out what you might say was the worst. I wanted to see what really was happening. And I was really so very struck and shocked uh, at the state of um, Asian elephants. Um, you may know the, uh, uh, the concept of pujan, the breaking of the spirits, that young a Asian elephants are unlawfully poached from the wild. Uh, they are kept in very poor conditions. They are isolated, which is disastrous for highly social species. Uh, they are starved and dehydrated. Um, and they are then beaten with hammers and knives and spikes to break their spirits the meaning of the word pajan, uh, for, re for ready use uh, to the command of humans um, in commercial settings and otherwise. And um, uh, Indian people have good and noble hearts from my experience. Um, uh, this is an aberration and it's largely fomented from outside India. But it is terrible, this, uh, this virtually universal uh, use of elephants when they're brought in from the wild unnecessary because the elephant's extraordinary cognitive ability and ability to learn through gentle commands and guidance. Um, I came back to England and spoke to many charity leaders and felt that their modus operandi was not quite what was needed. What was missing was the, uh, the approach of uh, seeking to regulate our own markets in the West in a proper way by um, collaborative engagement with the travel industry and the tour industry and all its emanations, holiday uh, hotels and so on, uh, and also by seeking to exert pressure benignly but firmly on our political system uh, to seek change in that way too. And all of these causes, in my experience, are predicated on enormous public awareness and sympathy, whether it be the abolition of slavery, uh, uh, the uh, abuse of children in, in labour down the mines, uh, women's suffrage. We got up a petition, many rallied to the standard. Our petition now, we believe, is the largest in world history for, Asian, for, for elephants at all, out of tens of thousands. Our polling shows overwhelming support. Our policies are firstly to uh, try to regulate a market uh, which uh, is largely unregulated and needs self-regulated uh, uh, against um, unethical holidays and uh, resorts. Uh, also to encourage exchanges of veterinary um, professions between India and England particularly. Uh, and also to establish a model elephant sanctuary operating on responsible principles in India funded, part funded by the UK government, uh, and also a model Mahouts Centre, likewise funded by the two governments. We're making progress. We've got a ministerial meeting with DEFRA coming up shortly. We are receiving very um, respectful approaches from all parts of the travel industry. There is a real schism. Uh, things are changing. Many now are deciding clearly uh, to move with public sentiment and feeling towards ethical offerings. And we want to hold those up uh, most respectfully for attention. Um, those are our policies in a nutshell. We think we're making headway. And ultimately, we believe that what is good for elephants is without any question good for humankind and good for business. Thank you. Thank you. Ian, may I come to you next to speak a little bit about sure. your views tonight? Yes, thank you. Um, you, you this is certainly a, an opportunity to, to bend the ears of people who can wield influence in the travel industry. And I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of things. Um, it's always good to have a bag on stage out of which you can draw things. Have any of you seen this month's National Geographic magazine? It's on the newsstands now. I bought this in the station the other day. And the cover story is wildlife tourism, but the suffering of animals behind some forms of wildlife tourism. Now, um, it was mentioned that the 
40 odd years ago, uh, Sir David Attenborough famously sat amongst a family of mountain gorillas. And out of that encounter and the conservation activity that it focused the mind of thousands of people all over the world on, uh, has developed a form of tourism. And I've been involved in that since its inception. And that is visiting mountain gorillas in the wild, out of a vehicle, on foot, in the forest. It's called gorilla tracking, although the Himalayan influence now means that many people sell it as gorilla trekking. But whether you're trekking or tracking, following the tracks, the aim is to walk through the forest until you find a family of gorillas and then sit with them for an hour. Sit with them in the sense of you try and maintain a seven meter distance. And that's for the safety of the gorillas because people coming from all over the world might be carrying germs that could infect the gorillas. So you want to keep far enough away that if somebody coughed or sneezes, it doesn't give the gorillas a cold or flu. And that form of tourism is now one of the main supports for the economy of two countries and a third, um, which is currently too unstable for tourism, the, the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. So Rwanda and Uganda, much of their foreign exchange that runs the, the, the government that, that benefits the development of the country comes from guerrilla tourism. A century ago, guerrillas were a target for trophy hunters. And I have books from the turn of the 19th, 20th century where people are talking about bagging a bull gorilla. Now notice the use of the term bull, which sort of dehumanizes a gorilla. It's a big male animal, so you call it a bull. And then it seems okay to shoot it. And that seems so far from the understanding and, and attitude of almost everyone on the planet today that it, it's, it's abhorrent. We still use the cattle terminology for elephants. We talk about bull and cow and calf and herds of elephants. And yet elephants have a brain that is four times the size of ours. They can communicate using infrasound over miles through forest and savanna, keeping in touch with their relatives. They have a, a multi-level society, a clan system, from the mother and infant, trying to avoid the cattle terminology, and her sisters and her aunts and her grandmother, perhaps, because it's intergenerational, their culture, they are a complex society. And when you start to respect elephants in that way, just as we have done with gorillas, gorillas were portrayed as monstrous. They're huge, they're dangerous, they've got long fangs, they've got muscles that, that could tear you apart. And yet now, tens of thousands of people, every year, go to Rwanda, in small parties and are taken out into the forest on foot with no protection and they sit this far away from a family of gorillas who are busy snacking and eating and the kids are playing and the adults are lying in the sunshine and people realize how close we are to them in so many of our behaviors and it, it's a life-changing experience for many people which is why a couple of years ago Rwanda decided to put the price up from what was already a, an eye-watering $750 for one hour with a family of gorillas, they just doubled it, $1,500. And the numbers, bookings dipped a little bit, but not very much. So as long as it didn't dip below half, they're quids in. And perhaps a few fewer tourists might be good for the gorillas. It's less pressure on that habitat. So there's an example where a species that used to be considered dangerous, used to be considered a target for trophy hunters. You'd kill one to stuff it and hang it on the wall or put it in a case. And now it's the basis of a multi-million dollar industry. It employs tens of thousands of people, drivers, craftsmen, chefs, people growing vegetables to sell to the lodges. It's an amazing success story. And the biggest success is that the last census of counting the gorillas from their nests and collecting droppings and analyzing the DNA and making sure we got the numbers right, we now know that there are just over 1,000 mountain gorillas, which doesn't sound like very many, but compared to 40 years ago when David Attenborough came and did his piece for, for Life on Earth, there were probably about less than half that. We don't know exactly because although we know one population well, in the Virungas we know there were 242 there, we don't know how many there were in Windy, maybe one or 200. So 
they've more than doubled in that same period. Almost every other kind of primate on the planet, except our own species, has been declining in that period. So with mountain gorillas, we're getting it right. And tourism is the key to that. Because suddenly gorillas are an asset. Now I want other countries to look at that and think, well, what assets have we got? Not just that we can drive people by in a bus, but species that we can win the trust of and take people on foot to observe in a peaceful way. Do you think that could be done with elephants? It's potentially dangerous, but before the gorilla tourism was developed, gorillas were considered to be very dangerous. They would come screaming and charging and yelling at you and frighten you away. And if they got hold of you, if they thought they were under attack, they have the capacity to tear you apart, literally, limb from limb. But I have taken hundreds of people to see gorillas, and not one of them has been torn even a little bit limb from limb, <laughs> which is good news. So that's an example of conservation benefiting from carefully regulated, well-managed tourism. And I wonder how we can apply that to other species and other areas. And I'd be most interested to hear your views on that. I've only been a visitor to India. Never lived there and worked there. But I've been, as well, most of you are, I'm sure, uh, amazed by the, the beauty and diversity of its life forms and its habitats. And in the light of that UN report that was mentioned in the introduction, we know that we're messing up this planet. We know we have to change. Could I ask a quick question of you lot? How many of you, as part of your tour package, offset the carbon emissions from the flights? Do any of you buy carbon credits so that your, your clients can travel with some salving of conscience about the emissions that their travel causes? The two, two hands tentatively came up there. That's something you can easily do. And some people criticize offsetting because it's not solving the problem. It certainly isn't the sole solution, but it helps if each of your tickets includes some money to plant trees, especially if it's been done through a community exercise that, that empowers communities and improves the, the habitat where they live and sequesters and stores carbon, that's a good thing. So there's a little thought you can take home. If you're not doing it already, please consider buying into the car carbon business so that your clients realize that as soon as they've paid their money, the carbon emissions they make when they travel to the world um, are being offset by planting trees somewhere or reducing carbon emissions elsewhere. That could be a, a, a take a message of, of value because we have to, as well as dealing with the, the small things that we're doing directly, we have to think in this global context. And perhaps we'll explore some of those ideas further. But that's just a, a, a quick introduction to why I'm in the room, why I'm very glad that you're here to, to hear what we have to say. Thank you. Well, I, I, this was a report because I will start from that uh, IUCN report saying that tourism is, so it's maybe correct um, that it's um, uh, in facts and factual um, description of what tourism is doing to our nature world, but it's very unfair criticism. Generally, tourism is criticized quite heavily. Uh, it's a, in, in fact, whatever we are doing, it's um, doing quite a lot of damage um, to the climate uh, uh, and uh, even if you look at um, the surfing, uh, we do internet and the energy we spend, um, it's maybe a lot bigger uh, impact on our environment than tourism. Um, so we, it's, it's uh, something um, we need to correct tourism and that's why uh, I come from an academic background. I, didn't last in one subject for a long because I believe if you can achieve in 10, 15 years, uh, you could achieve and then it's time to move on. So I moved on from snow leopard to tigers to now I am a tourism professional and I realized that um, looking at wildlife tourism, I've been involved because I, our Saratoria Lodge is very close to the tiger reserve um, that, uh, and then wildlife tourism in India is very heavily criticized. So I tried to look at the, it's academically. Uh, that's what I've been doing it for uh, for last uh, three or four years. We've done few studies uh, to see the impact, the value of wildlife tourism um, for wildlife conservation and um, and to communities. And I find it has got a tremendous potential. I will straightforwardly say that in 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 tiger habitat, where the local community, the rural landscape. Um, 
where we have not made any impact of our 7%, 8% growth. Uh, tourism has the potential to increase two to three times income. Uh, if you, I look at the, the based on my studies, it is very much possible that in, t in tiger habitat communities we can buy, if you run tourism properly, we can really benefit it. Um, but the problem in India is that we running tourism, wildlife tourism, the way we run tourism in Taj Mahal or in Redford, you select a hotel of your choice based on your budget and interest, buy a permit, go see Taj Mahal and come out. And same thing you do in a tiger reserve, select a hotel, go buy a permit, permit entry and see a tiger and come out. It doesn't benefit much community. Despite it is not promoted, not targeted uh, for a wildlife conservation, and then it's criticized for that it is not contributing. But despite all this uh, negative side of it, when we look at the impact it has in terms of economy, we looked at four tiger reserves in Madhya Pradesh, and we find it generates about 20 plus million dollars in these four tiger reserves, where we have about 100, 130 lodges. And of around 55% of that goes to the community. And if, look at, if you can double that, and the fee, entry fee for going to visit Tiger Reserve is just 1500. If you double that to 3000 rupees, and all that money goes to the community, and about, if you look, calculate it, um, and one lakh of rupees per family, you give cash in hand, you will be supporting almost 4,000 families, which will be about several. So if you design it little properly, direct the benefits to the local community, you can seriously change the lives of the community in other area and use this incentive to generate some kind of behavior changes which is more environmentally friendly. It is possible. Um, that's where we've been now for the last two, three years, we're working. Um, and, um, Try, we selected an area and that's where we want to work because tiger cannot survive on its own in our protected areas because protected areas are small. If you look at, we look at the study, which a paper which I published, you look at last 100 years where we have lost tigers are in a small protected areas. So we have not created large protected areas, but we have managed very well. What India has managed as far as the tiger is concerned is not the numbers. We don't have the numbers. We, when we 73, when we started, and now in 1940, uh, 2014, numbers were less, about few hundred less than what we have. What, what the success story of India is, which none of the tiger range countries was managed to do it, that we have kept hold on the distribution of tigers. Tigers are found in every nook and corner of the forest that tiger used to present. Maybe smaller patches. Now, if you want to reverse the condition, it can spread very easily. If we had numbers, but we had numbers in three or four places, we would have had problems. But India is very successfully has managed to do it. And so the to future survival of tigers, to expand it range again and benefit the communities um, is very much possible. But it, the problem, the, the, the key would be the non-protected tiger habitat where people are. Now, the conservation of tiger or nature in non-protected habitat is left on volunteer basis for local community to participate with tiger, live with tigers, live with wild animals on a volunteer basis because it's ethical, it's friendly to environment, but it's not economical uh, benefit to the local community. That I think we need to change. We have to provide incentives to the local community and then only you can talk to them about conservation. And tourism is one way. Uh, there are several models there. If you look at around the world, there are quite a lot of different models um, that is possible uh, to generate that um, kind of revenue. And easily in India, uh, at least I can say that you can double or triple within a few years' time, less than a decade for the, uh, those community. And we can really restore quite a lot of areas which we have lost. Second, the last thing I'll say that somehow in India, the media or what, however it works, it filters out the success stories. India, only the negative stories comes out. But India, if you look at the success stories, are way up. If you compare with the, the, the developing world or developed world, we, we, we are way up uh, in terms of, you look at this, as I said, tigers is one of the, one of the examples. We look at uh, smaller mammals like um, pygmy hawk. The 
ex situ where we've taken out some animal, bred and then now released. There's very few examples in the world to match that, but we don't hear about it. Nobody writes about it. So there are n number of stories like that in India, and India is quite capable of bringing change very, very quickly. I mean, those three wonderful presentations really telling us something that perhaps we already knew, but we're thinking about not just a business, all of you here are running a business, but to pick up on Ian's word, life-changing experiences. And we're talking about changes for tourists themselves, of course, but also for locals, how they benefit. Um, you know, many of the people who know most about the animals are the locals who have experience of living with and working with animals. I mean, I doubt an outsider would have thought it was safe to walk among gorillas or elephants. You would need some local knowledge there. I mean, your wonderful example, Raghu, in your book, when you lose your flashlight and your tracker just knows how to go walk back in the dark and find it. You know, these, these things, changing and changing life for the animals too, as Duncan was saying, that it's very important what kind of wildlife tourism we're talking about. That idea of not just turning up on a bus and clicking as many photographs as you can, but actually interacting, taking away something that isn't just, you know, some holiday snaps and what a great time you have, but the idea of actually changing something in you and something around you. Because I think one of the things that United Nations report, which I hope you, you have a look at, makes us all realise is that it doesn't matter what we do, we're part of it. And we have to be thinking about it. And I think most people, when they travel, enjoy finding out these experiences and what they can do to actually make a difference. And, you know, we've talked about the great charismatic animals, you know, gorillas, tigers, elephants, of course. But I remember on one of my tours, from one of the hotels that's here, just by coincidence, I was there. For me, a morning walk going round with a local showing me just the bee, you know, the, the insects and the birds ends up being just as fascinating. There's all sorts of wildlife tourism. But what, what can the tourist be made to feel that she or he can do to help? Would you, perhaps, Ian, maybe you might think of what, what can the tourist... I mean, obviously, if you're pouring in one and a half thousand dollars, that is making an economic impact. But to help? Hmm. Um. There are certainly some things that we can urge tourists not to do. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned people wanting to take photographs, and there is a hashtag selfish selfie. Um, the selfie when you're with an animal that has been thrust upon you. So if your tourists are in a market and somebody plonks some animal on you, takes a photograph and takes some money from you, then you are helping to perpetuate the trade in whatever that animal is. And it might be a baby monkey, it might be a uh, it used to be often baby chimpanzees in, in, um, in Spain. Um, there were beach photographers with a baby chimp, uh, baby gibbons, uh, sometimes baby big cats, a, a tiger cub or a lion cub or a cheetah cub. Um, that's obviously a no-no. But ironically, it's that very image of David Attenborough sitting surrounded by gorillas that is like a cultural meme. We've all absorbed that. And what picture do we want to send to our friends when on holidays as surrounded by the animals? And most animals are not going to sit there while you do that. So if the animal has been drugged and changed, chained to the ground, as, as this spread of images of people having their selfies with a tiger show, this is in Thailand, um, the tourist gets the photograph that makes their profile look cool because they're sitting next to a tiger. And you have to say to your clients, well, think beyond the moment. How did the tiger get there? What is the rest of its life going to be? What is its day-to-day -day existence if it's being drugged and sat on a box for tourists to come and take their picture? And that's done with so many species, with orangutans, with lorises, with, with all sorts. Um, so avoid the kind of photograph souvenir that involves someone forcing an animal to do something. And, and Duncan would obviously reinforce that from the point of view, if you're riding on an elephant or standing beside an elephant and there's a man with a pointed <coughs> stick standing beside you, that elephant is there because he knows or she knows that if she puts a foot wrong, it's going to hurt. And it's that control by pain <coughs> that Save the Asian Elephants is trying to employ you to help stop. And that's why we want a law in this country saying, if something is illegal in Britain, which beating and jabbing elephants would be, then we shouldn't be selling holidays to go and benefit 
profit from that happening overseas. Seems a simple thing. We don't allow people to sell holidays to go and uh, sleep with children because paedophilia is illegal. But it's so offensive to people that we have a law here saying you can't sell that experience somewhere else. Well, wildlife experiences are just as important. And the same standards that we have in this country should be applied to any holiday that you guys sell, I would suggest. Could I just, just add to that a little? And it's a really huge now and dawning realisation amongst the buying public in, within these shores but across the world that elephants, Asian elephants included, are wild animals. They are not only profoundly dangerous, they are categorised by our DEFRA Secretary of State as Category 1 most dangerous animals alongside lions, tigers and crocodiles. One point I've made to ABTA, Association of British Travel Agents, whose current guidelines endorse uh, the riding of elephants. Their only comment is they shouldn't be bareback. Uh, and you might, uh, sorry, they, should, they could either be bareback or, wearing, uh, or, or using a mat, is that I assume, you know, they would not counsel or endorse the riding of a lion, a tiger, or a crocodile, unless something very serious is being done to them. And uh, I would add to the concept of not riding um, an elephant, I mean, look, a lot of people start from the premise that an elephant is a mighty beast, and indeed it is, but particularly for moving on the level, pushing and pulling. Its back is not made for weights of any particular sort. It's got a fragile spine, let alone by the time you put all sorts of adornments, like a, 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 a howdah and four large tourists and a mahout and various other paraphernalia. It's a mighty thing when it's struggling up a hill in burning heat, uh, without relent, without uh, water and so on. Uh, and terrible incidents happen. But it's not riding alone. It's any direct or close contact uh, activity with an elephant uh, denotes what has gone before, the real harm. And this, as you may well recognize, is the weapon that's used. This is a real working uh, ankus or bull hook used to jab, strike, rip the flesh of young and adult elephants alike to put out their eyes sometimes, uh, and also for breaking of limbs um, with, with metal devices of uh, different sorts. Um, now, when we look at the, those cold facts, um, we realize that any activity that's involved that really is not conscionable to any of us. Um, and this is the huge, I would almost call it revolution, but it is a huge a dawning realisation upon the buying public what the life story of Asian elephants is. Many species across the world suffer. We, we've alighted on elephants. This is most certainly not a criticism of my favourite country, India, but there are problems uh, with them. So these close and uh, immediate contact uh, activities will include what might appear superficially to be entirely conscionable and ordinary activities. The feeding of an elephant, the scrubbing of an elephant, um, playing football, um, dancing, standing upright or on top of each other or in a circle, and a million other things that are everyday offerings, sadly, of, of, many, of, of many enterprises. All of those are predicated on this abuse. So my answer to the question uh, what can tourists do, of course, is not to participate in that. Uh, a, a growing number of you I know, and I'm immensely uplifted and, 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 and gratified to hear uh, from our discussions today about your concern on these matters, your concern to follow public sentiment and the public mood to change. And I think that's right. It's in one's commercial interest as well as a matter of deep conscience. Um, the species generally... Um, has depleted enormously. We believe it's continuing to deplete. Uh, the reason it's not going faster is because the, because the numbers now are so small. So even putting at its basic, um, the loss of this species, which will threaten to happen over time and not much time, will not stand as a great legacy of the great country of India at all. 
on the contrary, to start turning back now can uh, really earn great credit for India and, and to start now to adopt uh, more widely the ethical principles that are showing themselves at every turn um, is enormously welcome, but we must keep pushing. Above all, we do need a law in this country, not least to protect those who have chosen the ethical route and who should not be disadvantaged in the market by any who lag behind with unscrupulous practices. And so we hold up for huge credit those who, um, and the many who have turned the corner and are starting now a better way. Uh, we believe in and wholeheartedly support genuine sanctuaries. That sounds like a glib phrase. But we identify the defining characteristics of a genuine sanctuary. Uh, on our website and our other published material, it's very clear what they are, and of course they exclude direct and close contact activities. I think that's very important, it, and in India indeed there are many wildlife groups um, who are involved with the Asian elephant. Now even when you, when you go to forestry reserves, you will, off, you will rarely be offered an elephant ride. Now many areas have stopped them. Rugby, you're probably more familiar with Yeah, no, I know, I can, with the confidence I can say the select group of travel professionals here and agents I don't think they have ever sold a trip like this or they will be selling it um, like this um, it's but not possible um, we have to target that um, group also but one of the things which I think everybody can uh, do um, is that make simple conversation wherever you're going talk to them about your interests yours your views on in climate change, and especially to your lodge owners, your DMCs, um, the partner, partner in India, it will make a big difference. They start thinking, it will not immediately react, but it will make a difference what's been preferred, what's not been preferred. Talking to your, wherever you stay, the staff, the guide it goes, you talk to them what they're doing, why they are not doing, they should be doing. You have to, so that when you travel, travel with, with a motive that you're going to bring the change. The minority brings the change, majority will follow. Uh, and you, uh, the, the travelers and, and the travel agents are the big um, driver and you can change the direction of the course and simply, simple conversation will make a big, big difference. But you have to talk, you have to show your interest, you have to make then what, why they are not, the question to ask, why they are not doing, why they sh should be doing, um, it will really make a big difference. I think the making the difference is the big theme we're coming across. I wonder if anybody in the audience would like to ask any questions, perhaps to specific members of our panel, about any concerns you've had or any ideas. Yes. Yeah. I'd also like to intervene here because I think it's important to remember there are many different types of elephant keeping in India. That there's a, there's a pure tourism, you know, like in Jaipur, Amber Fort, elephants kept in, in sort of tin sheds in this elephant village who then walk up a hill with people riding on them. I think everybody knows what the opinion on that would be. But there are forestry elephants which are kept yes. in other parts um, who are semi-wild and are used in management of the forest. 
And then I think also there is Indian tourism which is geared towards elephants, such as Sadasara in Mysore, you know, one of the huge tourist attraction. So, you know, I think it's a very complicated question here. And I think each situation has to be looked at in turn. That in principle, we don't like, but... And I, I can give you an example, and again, another success story in India, where with dancing bears, mm. uh, completely gone now. Occasionally, you will see. And there were family um, livelihood issues were there. They have been rehabilitated quite successfully in India. Uh, and then for the animals which were there, there uh, um, a sanctuary has been created. Mm -hmm. So it, if there, is, there are ways, uh, uh, but it is possible to do it. Um, uh, there are many success stories like yeah, that. that. That's fine. I, mean, I, understand, I understand the concept of, and, and the, you know, the argument that this was a DMC, but it was arguing to me. And I was saying that there was any of that sort of stuff in any of the programs or whatever. And they were kind of defending Can I, can I, can I, see, the, 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 this is an issue which is, should not be related to the market forces. It's, it's issues, uh, different issues. You have to separate those two issues. The market forces will come up saying that what we'll do, the arguments will come. So I think you have to separate it. If it's a conservation issue, the priorities on conservation. If it's an animal welfare issue, it's an animal yeah, welfare issue. So, so the example of the bears, I think, was particularly good because at this sanctuary in Agra, um, Wildlife SOS, one of their priorities was to find new work for the people who had made their livelihood from the bears. And I think mm. that's absolutely essential, that you can't just, you know, come along and say, you know, it's like me coming along and saying, I don't like you running a big car that's not environmentally friendly and driving off in it myself, you know, and <laughs> leaving you... <laughs> You know, but I, th I think it's that way in which it has to be yeah. done, it has to be planned. Yeah. I, I, I was going to ask what the source of your information was, and you've since given it. And, uh, it it's not a story we're very familiar with, that the prosperity of an entire village and its community is predicated upon uh, the use uh, of elephants for commercial yeah, purposes. What, what, what I would say, uh, I mean, there are several uh, responses to give to that. Firstly, this is not a panacea, this arrangement of the use of elephants. Uh, certainly not for the elephants, nor indeed for the mahouts, you know, the daily managers of the elephants. They are a class for whom we have a beating heart as well. They are a class that are, frankly, economically enslaved to the system to a very great degree. They are a very, very different sort of mahout from those that prevailed uh, across the range states, uh, even two, certainly three and four generations ago. They live a, a pretty grim and awful life. They are very impoverished. They are of not only little, but virtually nil education. They live away from their families. They live in terrible squalor. They resort very sadly very sadly, to drugs and to alcohol, and they often take it out on the elephant. Now, we're not offering a game of uh, blame. It's very sad for all concerned, and the idea that we should restore such a system and endorse it is wrong. The other point is that to look after an elephant benignly and well is no more expensive than to brutalize an elephant. And that elephants, if they're properly treated, and I want to make it really abundantly clear, that my organization and all those who stand for it and speak for it, and there are people of very high experience and eminence, they are not uh, su suggesting that um, to elephant tourism should be abolished. I think we've had a few people say that, not, certainly not today, but in the past. It is complete nonsense. We absolutely 
endorse the notion of ethical elephant tourism. Not only that, but that may be the last and only hope for the Asian elephants as a species. We strongly endorse those who have corrected what may have been less ethical practices and operate genuine sanctuaries. Um, we would fervently wish those mahouts who live a grim existence, often doing what they don't want to do and often doing much, much more than they should do to the elephants, we want them to be part of the solution, absolutely. So, for example, uh, if you establish what we call broadly a genuine sanctuary, that means elephants observed from a respectful distance in their natural habitat, or at least as natural as is consistent with protecting them from poaching and so on, um, interacting with each other, um, that is actually what the public want. And the mahouts will have a great, very great, uh, a great part in that, in the, uh, in the general management of the enterprise. In different ways, they have to be trained and so on. But there is a distinct parallel with what's been quite rightly mentioned by Raghu uh, and Rachel, I think, about the, um, really the abolition of the dancing bear phenomenon where those people were brought in as part of the solution. And that's absolutely what we stand for. And the, the notion that it is acceptable and proper, let alone in a, a nation like India, with its vaulting and very good ambitions to stand at the head of the world, at the councils, the top tables of the world, uh, that it should persist in risking uh, the lives of of its good people and of those who come to visit the country in a wanton way is just wrong. Two weeks ago, I interviewed a lady in her early middle age who 20 years earlier had been at a, an elephant uh, entertainment resort. This, in fact, was in Thailand with her sister on one side and her father on the other. She was watching, with, without any warning or sign, she was watching an elephant entertainment show. And it involved the regular um, stabbing of the elephant. And at one point, the mahout astride the elephant <coughs> struck too hard, a bit too hard, and he struck an open wound. And the elephant's eyes, she said, just changed. And it charged the three of them, and it thrust one of its tusks straight through the chest of her sister beside her, who died three hours later in her arms. And the other tusk through this lady's groin, and she said, but for being rather overweight, I too would have met the end. And her father was struck with great force by the elephant and was in a wheelchair for the next 11 years. Now, what makes that story so particularly ghastly and awful and reprehensible, and all of us must take a share of the blame, is that the same resort, now, years later, it's actually um, 18 years later, is still thriving. The only difference is it's much bigger. Um, I'm afraid quite a few British tourists are sent there, and the, the show continues. I, I've said, to Michael Gove's senior civil servants. Who amongst you, or those you serve, will be the first to stand at the bar of the House of Commons and explain why a system has been allowed to subsist, uh, which has brought about the death of an, uh, yet another British tourist um, uh, through attack by a highly abused Asian elephant. There was no answer, and indeed there is no answer. No one's going to want to do that. I put it to Michael Goh as well, and I'm awaiting his answer. But this is a system that no one really wants, and the alternatives are there to be had. And I am so grateful that you, as a community of good people, making a tiny legitimate uh, living, um, want to change for the better, see the opportunities, and we can do it, and we should do it. It's there to be done, and ultimately to save this iconic species, which has been there for millions of years, and is entirely properly harnessed to the perfectly good cause of legitimate um, commerce. I, we have no objection to that. 
Um, I, I do not recognise the, with respect, sir, the, 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 the idea either that um, a whole village is predicated on... No, 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 no,
educated economists have ne never been able to reach uh, through their 8% growth rate. The tourism has the potential to reach to those. And I think we need to change that model, the way we run tourism, and just make the local communities the primary beneficiary of anything which we do. Uh, it can bring in the changes. Well, I think that's a wonderful moment. I'm very tempted to make some link between dung and going for drinks, but I think I'll desist. <laughs> Please go and enjoy yourself and do talk to our panel members again. Thank you. <laughs>